I do want to just say one thing before I introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, we as a church are going through some of the most interesting times I think the church has had to go through in recent lifetimes. And what I mean by that is we're having to figure out how do we do church spread apart in a room or in various rooms like we have this morning or at home and on campus. How do we do that? It's no doubt been one of the hardest seasons I've had to pastor through in my 15 years of pastoring and the leadership decisions we have to make and the the fatigue of leadership decisions or the fatigue that comes from just trying to be creative and how do we do all of this. And I'm not alone in that. We have a great staff. We have about 26 people on our staff and certainly they're having to make decisions with me and, and we're leading forward. And then we have eight other elders who I serve with and we're leading forward and making decisions. And it's hard. We're having our own personal struggles. One of our uh, pastors this weekend, his son was in a bad car accident. Another pastor a couple days ago lost his father to COVID. Uh, many of our staff have had COVID. We've had our own personal trials in the midst of trying to lead a church. It's exhausting in a lot of ways. And I got to tell you, it's exhausting also when we have at times a lack of unity among those in the church. So as your pastor, but also as your brother in Christ, I want to just encourage you, let's continue to get along and work through the differences and even the difficulties of this season. I get emails of people who are pro-masks and think we all should wear masks and they're offended by those who don't wear masks. And then I have emails from those who don't wear masks who are offended that we aren't trusting the Lord enough and maybe we should, shouldn't be wearing masks. I get it from everyone, all different spectrums. And listen, I know we all have different opinions on this time, but it doesn't mean that we should lose unity or have disunity in the body that would degrade our witness to the community during this time. So please continue to live at peace with one another. Please continue to be sensitive to one another, knowing that there might be various views of how this whole pandemic should be handled or how the church should be handling it. Uh, believe me, I have a lot of people who have told me how they think I should be handling it. And I listen to those voices, but I listen to the Lord first and foremost. And I want Ephesians 4, 3 to be the verse that binds us during the season, that we are bound together by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was with, is within us, and that we strive to keep peace. So let's strive to keep peace and realize that as we do that, our light will be bright for South Denver and those who desperately need to know the hope within us, all right? So let's continue to keep our eyes focused on Christ. With that said, I want to introduce to you a man that I believe is one of the greatest preachers I've been able to share a stage with, yet alone get to know. This is a man that I love dearly, and I got to know him, man, I guess it'd be five, six, seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, maybe more than that, more than that. Um, but we were together at Mission Hills, and he's come and preached here often. If you've seen him about a year ago, you'll, you'll be familiar with him. His name is Daniel Henderson. Uh, but he hasn't been here in about a year because he had a sabbatical. We had this thing called COVID uh, and all these other reasons. We just haven't had him back. But he's back today and joining us with this series. This man uh, not only is a great preacher, but he's a great man of God. And uh, be it conversations on his patio with our wives present or just conversations over the phone or text messages, he continues to show me the power of the gospel message. And I think you're going to hear that today and see that today, that our power and our greatest focus should be Christ himself. So again, this is Daniel Henderson. He is the president of Strategic Renewal, a great ministry that invests in pastors all over the globe. And I'm one of those recipients. And I can't wait for you to receive what God has through him today. Will you pray with me for him? Him as he comes to the stage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for the way that you have through a lifetime of ministry and study of your word and just intermingling with your spirit through his own personal time. Lord, you have developed him to be a deliverer of what we need on behalf of your spirit. So God, will you use him today as a, a new chef in the kitchen to bring forth spiritual food that your spirit has made clear to him and that our spirits must receive from him. Lord, I believe the preaching is your word through your man. So God, use your man today to speak your word by the power of your spirit. We thank you for this opportunity for us to be together, be it online or in person, and to worship in this way. Now give us attentive hearts. Speak to us, Father. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Josh. Thank Love you, you brother. Praise so you. good to be back. And we've been around. We've been going to church. I just haven't preached is what he uh, was referring to. And it's good to be back uh, again. And so grateful for this church. And uh, we're just really, really 
in love with what God is doing here. We continue in a series called The Longing, and uh, uh, Josh started that last week, and I so enjoyed that. I even got some of his notes and stole some of his ideas, and uh, we're trying to stay in sync with one another. But today, specifically, we're talking about waiting on our on-time God, and so that'll be the focus of our message. We'll be looking at a couple brief passages in Galatians and Philippians, but we're, or in Ephesians, but we're going to park in the book of Philippians. So I invite you to take your Bible, please. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Philippians 3, as you're turning, Josh already mentioned the wonderful worship team, and uh, I just got to do a couple call outs as well. There's a Mitch. I don't know who Mitch is, but he did my PowerPoint. God bless that guy. He's my best buddy today. Uh, so thank you, Mitch. There's Ryan and Ben and Beth in the back room. Uh, Joey helps. Lisa helps. So many people behind the scenes. Would you just thank the Lord for these behind the scenes servants who uh, really allow all of this to happen, and we love them and are so thankful for them. I love to stand in honor of God and His Word, so would you stand with me? I'm going to read in Philippians. I'm going to pick up chapter 3 and verse 18, Philippians 3, 18, and we will go into chapter 4 and verse 1. As you know, in the original language, there were no chapter breaks. Those are just there to help us keep track, uh, but we're going to read into chapter 4 and verse 1. Allow me to read as you follow along. Paul writes these words. Brothers, join, me, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20 will be kind of our anchor verse. Let me read that again. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. My beloved, would you pray with me once more? So, Father, uh, once again, I ask that you would give to me your servant understanding, unction, and utterance. Understanding that the clarity and power of your word would, would be received and communicated, unction to say it in the power of your spirit, utterance to make it helpful to your people. Allow me to be conscious of the indwelling spirit of God whose primary goal is to glorify Christ. And allow each of us as we listen today to be attentive to the voice and teaching of the abiding and guiding Spirit of God. So that we will apply what He has told us in such a way that we will be not only transformed and equipped, but empowered to live as agents for the gospel in such an important and needy time in the world around us. And we pray this for the sake of His name and for the advancement of His kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to begin with a question this morning. How good are you at waiting? Do you enjoy waiting? That's kind of the theme of these, these weeks. Uh, I don't know about you, but that is not one of my strengths. Perhaps you have been in those cases where you've been in a doctor's office and it appears that the nurse has forgotten that you were there and you wait, wait, wait for that annual physical. Maybe you've sat in one of those beautiful DMV plastic chairs uh, looking at the screen wondering when in the world are they going to call my number uh, perhaps as you think about waiting, you have uh, had to listen to this irritating, cheesy music play 15 times, hoping that some actual service representative will pick up the phone and help you out. Uh, maybe you've sent a really important and heartfelt text to a friend, and you've waited for a few minutes, you've waited for hours, and so far they've never responded. Maybe you're enjoying waiting for the actual final outcome of this election. How many of you like that? You're, you're twisted if you do, all right? Yeah, I mean, we just don't do too well at waiting, do we? And yet the reality is uh, we, we need to understand the importance of waiting, especially at a season like this. It's hard to be patient. Reminds me of a story of a husband who was going by the grocery store after work to pick up some groceries for his wife. And as often is the case, he kept passing uh, the same customer. In this case, it was a, a young dad and his little three-year-old boy named Billy. 
uh, his, his three-year-old boy, and they were going through the aisles, and uh, they, he noticed how uncontrol, uh, out of control this little boy was. In fact, at one point, they passed, and he said, now, Billy, this won't take long. And passed him in another aisle, and, and uh, the dad was quietly saying, Billy, calm down, calm down, we'll be done in a few minutes. They, they go by the dairy case, and now the boy is just totally out of control. He's saying, Billy, settle down, we're almost out of here. And they finally get to the checkout counter, and at this point, Billy is screaming, and Dad is saying, Billy, we'll be in the car in just a few minutes, and then everything will be okay. Uh, this husband was impressed, and as they walked out of the store, he heard the dad once again say, Billy, we're done. It's going to be okay. And so he tapped the dad on the shoulder and said, I've been so impressed with your patience and, and your understanding uh, with your little boy. And he said, uh, your little boy named Billy said, no, you don't understand. I'm Billy, right? I almost blew that early on, but uh, he's talking to himself the entire time. Uh, the fact is, sometimes we got to talk to ourselves, don't we, as we're waiting, whether we're dealing with a present situation or looking forward to a future one. Last week, as Josh began this series, he referenced the familiar verse, Isaiah 40, 40 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And he noted that the original Hebrew word was really the idea of being bound with or interwoven with the Lord. The waiting is not really passive, it's very active, and it's rooted in trust and intimacy with God. When I think about waiting, I think about those days when he used to be able to eat inside restaurants. Some of you remember that? Uh, and, and there's a staff member called a waiter. Now, what they aren't doing is sitting in the back room, looking at their watches, tapping their fingers passively. What does a waiter do? A waiter serves, right? A waiter pays attention. A waiter is engaged with the customer. And when we think of the word waiting, not only, as we saw last week, it's actively being interwoven, bound with the Lord, but it's also the idea of actively serving the Lord. I heard years ago, and I love it so much, this truth, that there's no time lost in waiting when you're waiting on God. There's no time lost in waiting when you're waiting on God, because it is an active, intertwined relationship with God that even in the process becomes transformational for us. But we've kind of taken it to another step, and that is now the idea of longing. It's not just a passive waiting, but it's an internal longing. So another question for you, what are you longing for this Christmas? Some of us, we hear all the songs and we're longing to be home for Christmas. We're longing for a white Christmas. Uh, maybe we're longing for a, a replay of the happy memories of days gone by, longing to open presents, longing to have another taste of grandma's horrible fruitcake just because it's nostalgic, right? Uh, maybe we're longing for a long winter's nap. But too often our longings are backward. We are longing for what used to be. In fact, we're even looking back to what was so amazing and beautiful at the first coming of Christ, the manger scenes, the miracle of Christmas, the virgin birth. But as we're learning, and today we especially will learn, we need to focus forward, not just backward. As we celebrate the first coming of Christ, we must also cultivate a desire and a longing for His second coming or His future advent. And to that point, I want you to look at just Ephesians 3.20 just for a moment. We're going to walk through this passage. But notice this one verse, and you see it on the screen, our citizenship is in heaven and from it, we, and I inserted the word eagerly because most translations uh, actually have it translated that way, and that's the real meaning. We eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be the focus of our longing at Christmas time. Weymouth, who was uh, another translator, I think most literally translated, and he said it this way We are waiting with longing expectation. And again, that captures the theme the teaching, the heart of this series. The point is that it really means an earnest, patient waiting and expectation, and I love this, the withdrawal of our attention from inferior objects. How many of you would agree at Christmas there are lots of inferior objects that can get our attention, that can capture our emotion? They're not bad things. I mean, there's the lights, the songs, the presents, the festivities, the food, but in this Christmas season, our longing needs to be focused, as Paul says here, on the future coming of Christ as we celebrate the first coming of Christ. Now, this is a theme throughout the New Testament. 
And I just want you to kind of sit back and, and think about the, the abundance of some of these truths about where our longing should be focused at this season of the year and every day of our lives. In Romans 8, verses 19 through 23, you see it on the screen, but it says, the creation waits with, here it is again, eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, talking about our ultimate redemption in heaven. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit within us, groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons of God. So you see it there, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. We see it again in Galatians 5, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of our ultimate righteousness. And then finally in Hebrews 9:28, it describes us as those who are eagerly waiting for Him. So as we think about the word Advent, and we are pausing now to celebrate His first coming and remembering all of those beautiful realities we need to have within our hearts, a fresh longing for His second coming as well. So I want us to see four things that we must do as we eagerly wait for our on-time God, and we're going to emphasize that in just a moment. Now, we're not going to talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Uh, I'm kind of pan-trib. I know it's all going to pan out, right? So we're not going to get into that. We're just going to talk about the spiritual realities that we need to embrace in light of the future coming of Christ in our day-to-day -day walk with Him. And the first commitment is this. We must remain confident in His faithfulness confident in his faithfulness. You see, again, Carrie already mentioned it, but Advent is a time of expectation and hope. It literally means arrival or coming. It's a season marked by longing. And we often don't think about this, but if you lived in the Old Testament, those 1,300 years under the law, there was a progressive longing in the hearts of those Old Testament saints for the coming of Christ. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 9, that People who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow and death, a light has dawned for, you'll know this, unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be on his shoulders, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. You see, Old Testament saints were longing, they were longing for the coming of Christ. Uh, the song we sang earlier, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, and one of the lines we sang said, he is the desire of every nation, the joy of every longing heart, Israel's strength and consolation. So they were longing, and like we do, they wondered when. I think of the Old Testament writers who would say, how long, Lord, how long? They were longing for the Messiah. Well, here's a newsflash. It's found in Galatians chapter 4. I want you to read it with me. It's going to be on the screen. Let's read it aloud together because it's so important to our, this moment as we study this passage together. Share this with me. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under law. Do you note that phrase? The fullness of time had come. The writer in Galatians is saying, even though people didn't know all the details, there was an omniscient, all-knowing, sovereign, good God who knew the exact time when Jesus would come. You might ask, well, what made that time so significant? I'm glad you asked. Here's the answer. Uh, God was using, this sounds strange to us sometimes, God was using a godless government to actually prepare the way for the coming of Christ at just the right moment. You see, under Rome, all of society in that day had been united. For the first time really ever, there were good roads to every part of the known world of the time. For the first time in history, people could travel anywhere, including the early apostles, including Paul and Barnabas and Silas and the church planters, so that the gospel could go viral at that particular time. Culturally, the the world was unified. In fact, even though people had their own native languages, uh, the world all could speak Koine Greek, which became the language of the New Testament and the opportunity to communicate the gospel verbally in places far and wide. 
And spiritually, even though people were being demanded to to worship the emperor, it created in them a dissatisfaction. They saw the emptiness of that, and they were open to the life-changing message of the gospel. You see, this passage uh, reminds us, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, the deed of Christ, born of a woman, the humanity of Christ, the virgin birth, born under the law because he came to fulfill all the law in the prophets through his finished work on the cross. God was an on-time God. And here's the good news, friends, even though sometimes we're wondering when, Lord, some of you, I, I bet if we took a poll, some of you have been praying for the rapture in 2020. Lord, just get us out of this mess, right? And we're wondering when is it going to happen or when is Christ going to return? Whatever your view of all that is, I want to remind you, he's still an on-time God. In fact, look with me, if you will, one more verse I'm going to ask you to read with me from Ephesians, which again underscores this same reality. Notice what it says. Let's read this together. And this is the plan, all right? Here's the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and in earth. Friends, that is good news. God has not checked out. He hasn't lost his sense of timing. God knows exactly what's going on, just as he did the first time. This time, he will be on time. And that gives us confidence in his faithfulness, doesn't it? And so, that sets us up now to look at Philippians. I hope you still have your Bible open there. And I'm reminded, I remember a mentor of mine used to always say, God is seldom early, but he's never late. And we can trust him. But not only that, secondly, we need to keep a concentration of our focus. Verse 17, uh, Philippians 3, if you're there, Paul has been talking about his own commitment to Christ. In summary, he said, I count everything that I used to think was an achievement and was a a religious, you know, uh, accomplishment as, as trash, as dung, literally one translation says. All I want to do is to know Christ, to be conformed to him, to conform to his suffering, to to live in the power of his resurrection, to be obedient, sacrificial in my following of him. And I forget everything that's behind, and I press forward to what's ahead. And he's again looking heavenly. And so now he speaks to us. And he says, brothers, verse 17, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He says, I want you to have the heart I have as we're thinking about the coming of Christ. And I want you, notice this, I don't know if you write in your Bible or not, but I would circle, keep your eyes. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Truth is, where your eyes go, your choices go, and where your choices go, your life goes. And he said, I wanted you, in light of the coming of Christ, I want you to keep your eyes focused on those who walk in godliness. Sometimes our eyes go a lot of different places. Our smartphone, the news, the newspapers, people who disappoint us. But we need to keep our eyes on those who are examples of the faith. That gives us hope, doesn't it? So if you have an iPhone or a smartphone, there's a little function on there that is called screen time. You see this right here? I call this a truth meter <laughs> How many of you ever looked at the screen time function on your phone? The rest of you need to because it'll be a wake-up call. It reminds us of where our eyes are actually going. It's always a shock to realize how much time I have spent perusing social media, how much time I've spent reading, you know, pablum in the news, how much time I've spent on email or text. And again, all those can be fine. But again, where your eyes go, your choices go. Where your choices go, your life goes. Paul is saying, I want you to look at those. Keep your eyes focused on people who walk according to the spiritual example that God has called us to. Josh mentioned I had a sabbatical this summer for three months. It was my first sabbatical in 38 years. It long, long overdue. Josh, you get one soon. I'll write the elders and, and uh, uh, I'll demand that. Anyway, uh, no, I won't. I'll suggest it in the grace of God uh, with great persuasion. But anyway, um, one of the things I did was read biographies. And I honestly, I hadn't read a whole lot of biographies, but it was life-changing to read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Andrew Murray and so many others. That's part of how we keep our eyes on those who are spiritual examples to us. 
Uh, Josh uh, and I were backstage. There's a little room that they're fixing for him to do some studying and time in. It's, 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 it's a closet, basically. And I had one like that when I was a pastor. And on the walls of my closet, I actually had pictures of these people in my life. My father-in-law, who he and his wife were faithful in ministry for 60 years. My parents, whose lives have been transformed by the gospel. My brother, who has been a pastor now for 50 years. My brother-in-law, pastors who... And under their names, I had the qualities of their life that had most impacted me. And, and really, that's what Paul is saying to do. In all the distraction and all the waiting, fix your eyes on the godly people whose example can inspire you. When I was in college, a guy spoke in chapel several times. His name was Charles Tremendous Jones. I may have mentioned him in previous messages. And uh, he said something once, and I bought the old cassette tape. Some of you remember those. Uh, I listened to it, rewound it, wrote down what he said. And here's what he said, and you see it on the screen. All the truth in the world will do you little good until God brings a person across your path and you're able to see that truth in action. And then suddenly... That truth becomes a driving force in your life. Paul is saying, friends, if you're going to live like me, if we're going to live in light of the return of Christ, keep your eyes fixed on godly examples because they become truth in action. They lift you above all the muck of the distractions of this life, all the bad news that you're always trying to deal with, and they inspire you to faithfulness. I'd encourage you, if you're taking notes, just take a moment. Who are those people in your life? Maybe write a name down. And perhaps, again, fix your eyes on their example. So here's a little poll. This will be fun. How many of you have known Christ and have, by the grace of God, sought to be faithful to Christ, say, for 20 years or more? Anybody? You've been in Christ that long? How about 30 years or more? How about 40 years or more? Wow, there's a few. Stand up. You would, you, go, I'm not going to make saints. Just stand up. Stand up. Uh, those of you who walked with Christ 40 years or more, now get to know these people, right? Fix your eyes on them. Would you celebrate their faithfulness to God? God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much. You see, the Bible talks about honoring those who fear the Lord. And Paul is saying, as we look forward to the advent of Christ, fix your focus on the inspirational example of people who have gone before you. Third thing we need to do is to know the context of our fight. Look at verses 18 and 19. We're just walking through the text. Now Paul shows the other side of the coin, as it were. He says, in essence, the reason you need to stay with your eyes fixed on these godly examples because there are many who aren't that way. And he's not referring to, uh, you know, the Bill Mars and the Howard Stearns. I mean, those guys, you know, they need Jesus for sure. But he's actually referring to those who claim to be Christians, but who in the way they live are actually, this strong language, enemies of the cross. So how could that be? Well, because the message of the cross isn't about wearing Christian jewelry and putting on Christian bumper stickers. Uh, This past week, we were on vacation in Branson, Missouri. I'd never been there before. But it's like Christianville, right? Everybody's a Christian. Everybody's patriotic and, and, you know, they're singing Christmas songs. and, and, And that's kind of the culture we live in. And I'm not questioning the sincerity of any of those. I know many of them really love the Lord. But, but there are many people who, for personal gain, for, should we say it, political gain, and for other reasons, appear to embrace the faith. But notice in this passage, Paul's not talking about their talk. He's talking about their what? Rhymes with talk. I bet you could guess it, right? He's talking about their walk. Notice what he says. And he's saying this with tears. He's not celebrating this at all. It breaks his heart. He says, there are those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because the cross of Christ says, come and die, doesn't it? Take up your cross and follow me. Don't just embrace Jesus for personal gain or or for what might be impressive to the culture around you. Embrace the cross. Turn in repentance and faith to Jesus alone. Follow him sacrificially, lovingly to be like him. That's a mark of real faith. And he says their end is actually destruction. And again, that's not happy news, but it's real news, isn't it? Jesus said there will be many in that day who show up in eternity thinking they really knocked it out of the park when in reality there was not even a relationship. 
He says their God is their belly. The Greek word there for belly actually refers to the sex organs. He's talking about lustful appetites. Their God is their own desires. They subject the Bible to their lust rather than subjecting their lust to the Bible. And he says, and they glory in their shame. They're proud of their hypocrisy. They're proud of what they're doing that denies the gospel, and their minds are set on earthly things. Now, we don't know exactly who he's referring to in that context. Some say what they called Judaizers back then, people who believed that to be a good Christian, you still had to keep the law. We, those would be like modern-day legalists who make up all kinds of rules that you got to keep to be spiritual. Uh, there was another group called the Antinomians who believed that the body was irrelevant uh, as long as you spiritually were, were making an effort and you could do anything you want with your body in terms of immorality. Uh, we're not sure who he's talking about, but the fact is nothing's changed, has it? That within the camp of those who claim to be Christians, there are pop Christians who, who just want to preach a Jesus that makes you feel good about yourself, who, who just want Christianity to be a socially acceptable feather in your cap, but who are actually enemies of the real life-changing message of the cross. And so Paul reminds us, even as Jesus did, that there will be tares among the wheat, as Paul did later on, those who profess a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And friends, our real battle today is for the purity and power of the gospel the life-changing reality of why Jesus died on a cross that needs to be evident in us as we look forward to his return. There's a final commitment we need to make and look at verses 20 and 21. We need to not only remain confident in his faithfulness, our on-time God, not only keep a concentration of focus on those models who inspire us as we wait, not only recognize the context of our fight, but embrace our citizenship as those who are members of the faith. Verse 20 again, read it with me. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await, literally we eagerly await, or we long for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to make us like his glorious body. We will be transformed, we will be set free, not only from the the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but the very presence of sin someday. And he will do it by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. He will win, and he will do it on time. Paul is really referring to a a dual citizenship to these Philippian believers because they were citizens of Rome. Rome was 600 miles away, but that was the headquarters. That's where the emperor lived. They were to honor the emperor, to live according to the word of God, be light in the midst of darkness. But he says, your real citizenship is in heaven. It literally was a a colony of people who are in a foreign land. Even this morning, I was reading a devotional that said, we have checked in overnight to an earthly hotel on our way to an eternal destiny. And that's the reality. I've quoted before here, Grace, my friend Robbie Simons, who says, we are heavenese. I like that. I was going to tell you, turn to your neighbor and tell them they're heavenese, but you're not supposed to breathe on each other. So just point to them, all right? You're heavenese, all right? You're heavenese. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's our identity. We are literally heavenese. We are bound for heaven. I uh, had a book come out this year Uh, called Glorious Finish, and it was written for uh, church leaders. Again, we tend to get our eyes on all those who have bombed out, who have not finished well, but, but it was the idea we need to keep our eyes on heaven. We need to live for eternity as those who are called to the gospel, and it's true for everybody. In the process of that, I found a couple of quotes that I want to to land with here as we think about this by guys who are way smarter than me, but I think who put this in perspective, the reality that we are citizens of heaven. One of them is A.W. Tozer. I want you to see what Tozer said. He said, I can only hope that you are wise enough, desirous enough, and spiritual enough to face up to the truth that every day is another day of spiritual preparation. See, this whole life is just preparation for eternity. Because we're really citizens of heaven. We, we've just checked into this earthly hotel overnight. It's another day of testing and discipline with our heavenly destination in mind. Isn't that good? And then another well-known writer, Martin Lloyd-Jones, says it this way, and I love his take on it. He says, this life of ours on earth is but a preparatory one. 
The world is too much with us. That is our trouble. We are too immersed in our problems. We need to look ahead, to anticipate, to look forward to the eternal glories gleaming afar. The Christian life is a tasting of the first fruits of that great harvest which is to come. And Paul is reminding us, he said, you are citizens of heaven and you have an eager longing for that ultimate reality. And when I coach pastors, I tell them all the time, it's so emblazoned in my heart, uh, brothers, the scoreboard is in heaven. Any scoreboard you look at here is temporal, it's all going to burn. The real scoreboard's in heaven, and the scorekeeper is perfect, and he never misses a call. And that is our destiny, that is our citizenship, that is our hope, that is our heart. I say it this way, because we are heavenese, our advent focus here at Christmas time is ultimately forward rather than backward as we trust in Christ's power and timing to transform all things. So as we conclude, look at chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to land the plane here, mostly, all right? <laughs> Someone said, what's it mean when the pastor says in conclusion? Someone said, that absolutely means nothing. But anyway, uh, in conclusion, let me say this. We must stand firm as we await the advent of our on-time Savior. Let me say it again. We must stand firm as we await the advent of our on-time Savior. Paul says it this way, therefore, Philippians 4.1, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Now, by the way, you've heard it said before, the only two things that last forever are the word of God and the souls of people. And Paul is saying, my joy and crown in heaven is going to be people, people whose lives were influenced by the cross and by the gospel. But notice what he says, stand firm thus in the Lord. That word in the Lord literally means bound with the Lord. That brings us full circle. Remember the definition of waiting? To be interwoven or bound with the Lord? He's saying stand firm, bound in the Lord as you await the advent of his second coming. So as we close, I, I'd love to, to give you a clever story, a humorous anecdote but I want to close by reading a passage of Scripture because I just believe so much that if we're going to understand the Bible, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. We need to, to hear what the Holy Spirit said through multiple voices. As we think about standing firm, I want to, us to look at one final verse. And actually, I can't tell you to stand firm while you're sitting down. So why don't you stand, all right? And it's the idea of being strong, of being fully devoted to the Lord, of staying true to Him. I want to read what Peter said as he wrote to people who were under persecution, who were scattered abroad, who were suffering. But these are his words, and I'm going to walk through it slowly as we close and just reaffirm everything we've heard today through the writer Peter. Notice what he says. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Our God is on time, and his timing is not our time, but he's fully aware, fully ready, fully able, fully in control, and fully good. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. We stand firm on the promise today, don't we? As some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Let me just pause there and say, I believe today we've lost the message of repentance in our gospel presentations. Uh, the first thing John the Baptist said at the dawn of the gospel era was, was repent. Jesus' first message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the church started on the day of Pentecost, Peter's first gospel appeal was what? Repent and be baptized. It is a message of repentance and faith. What does that mean? That's an internal transformation, a turning that causes us by the grace of God to hate our sin and to love Christ. I've said it this way over the years, and uh, it's a little direct, but I'll say it anyway. Jesus didn't die to save you from hell. You say, man, that guy's a heresy. Hang on. Jesus didn't die to save you from hell. He, he died to save you from sin. And, and hell is just where sinners go. And, and again, that's where people become enemies of the cross. They don't hate their sin. They just want to play the Christian game. The reality is a real work of salvation is, as Peter says here, a message of repentance, turning from sin and turning totally by faith in Christ alone. But notice what he says here. 
But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and when the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. A final judgment, right? An accounting. And since all these things are thus to be dissolved, here's a great question. What sort of people ought you to be? Well, we are to live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting, here it is again, longing for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his, what, his promise again, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then finally, therefore, again, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Pastor Josh talked to us about that, didn't he, a few minutes ago. Some of you say, well, you know, I'm a good Christian and I'm going to, you know, plant my flag on this issue or that issue. No, if we're really waiting for the advent of Christ, we're going to live differently, aren't we? So in summary, and the band's going to come and we're going to begin to wrap up, but I want you to just see the takeaways. We stand firm on the promise of his timing. He is an on-time God, isn't he? We stand firm with the message of repentance and a life of repentance. We stand firm in patient waiting. We stand firm in holiness and godliness, and we stand firm, say it with me, at peace. Let's say it together, at peace. So this year, when you see this image, Yes, be grateful for what happened in the past, but be fixed on what's going to happen in the future and live accordingly. And may we sleep in heavenly peace. May we wake in heavenly peace. May we live in heavenly peace. May we speak in heavenly peace. And may we know that we are waiting on an on-time God. Would you pray with me? So, Father, in Jesus' name and by your Holy Spirit, would you preserve in our hearts truths that will help us think, feel, and live differently. God, I pray that we would trust your faithfulness as an on-time God when the timing in the world around us doesn't make sense. I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on examples of faithfulness that will inspire us to endure and to love you more. I pray, Father, that you would help us to recognize that There is a battle around us. There are enemies of the cross. And may it break our heart, but may it compel us to keep our eyes on you. And then, Father, let us live as heavenese. Yes, red, yellow, black, and white, but we're all heavenese in your sight. Remind us of that, Lord. And may we indeed live lives that are distinctive, preaching the message of repentance and faith and living at peace with one another at this Advent season, for the glory of our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen.